Welcome all of you tonight to a one of what has been a series of sessions by the uh, Richard Paul Richmond Center for Business Law and Public Policy on what we really think of as important events that are going forward. So we've had a couple of couple of sessions this year on taxes and the fiscal cliff and now we're turning to a set of events that I think on a going forward basis probably maybe didn't get as much attention in the political campaign. Maybe you'd say any substantive issue didn't get as much attention as it should have in the last, uh, in, the, uh, in the recent campaign. But I think this is one in particular that is something that we think is pretty important. We did an event on the future of the middle class for alums in Midtown earlier this year. And now we're going to really bring in to wonderful experts to talk about um, the future of the American worker. And we're gonna do this from a couple of different perspectives. We're gonna start with uh, Professor Eric Hurst, who's here from the University of Chicago. And Eric is going to talk about some recent work that he's done that is sort of thinking about the, you know, where low-skill workers, particularly low-skill men, have been um, getting jobs and what the future of that looks like. We'll then be followed by Jesse Green, who's a uh, senior fellow at the Richard, Rich, Richard Paul Richmond Center, who will give the perspective of somebody who's been long involved with manufacturing firms in the United States, predominantly in the technology area, but now also sits on the board of Caterpillar, who's been involved in some pretty high-profile um, labor issues to talk about kind of the perspective, sort of business perspective of this. So I told each of the uh, presenters that they'd have 15 or 20 minutes to kind of give some of their own perspective and then we'll have a little bit of a panel discussion where I promised I would take at least a couple of uh, challenging um, perspectives on this and then open up to questions, et cetera. So that's the, uh, that's the plan. So I wanted to start with Eric Hurst. Eric is a longtime friend. We've known each other for uh, at least uh, 15 yeah. years or something, some very long time, back when he had hair. Um, <laughs> hair up here. <laughs> um, so we've, uh, Eric is somebody who is one of the renowned scholars on macroeconomics anywhere in the country. He's written on a whole variety of things from housing to uh, how to think about whether people adequately save for retirement to um, a lot of important issues thinking about uh, monetary policy, well, not quite monetary policy, but um, how households I'm moving respond. There. I'm moving there. You're monetary moving there. Po monetary policy is next. Right. Well, <laughs> this will be a good time to think about monetary <laughs> policy with the Fed. Um, Eric is a uh, professor at the University of Chicago, um, where he has spent his entire uh, academic career. And um, without further ado, so I'm going to give you some thoughts, some facts that I've been thinking about to start, and then I am going to kind of put a little bit more structure on how do you turn some of those facts into a hypothesis and then kind of show you some of the conclusions I've had from a hypothesis and how I've kind of tested that. And what I've been thinking about now is what's been going on with non-employment, the propensity to work in the United States over long periods of time, including the recession. So, I gotta, I walk around, so. So if you people might have, you all might have seen pictures like this um, in the newspaper. This is the propensity to work for prime age, non-college men. What I mean by non-college, what I mean is people without a four-year college degree. So this is about 70% of men in this picture. And this is when I say prime age, I'm looking at 21 to 55 year olds. I'm going to do that in all of my talk today. And it's just basically the fraction of them who don't have a job. That's the way you should think about this picture. During the recession, that increased by about seven percentage points and has remained high outside of the recession. So usually when we go into a recession, non-employment increases, people lose jobs, and then we get jobs back. This hasn't happened in this recession. Non-employment has increased and has kind of remained at the same high level a year and a half or two and a half years after the recession has ended. I also want you to focus on the fact that this has been trending up over time. There's recessions kind of move it around, but if you kind of take a look at the peak of the business cycles, when things were right before the recession, 
the non-employment rate of men have been increasing over time. So that's a fact one that you want you to keep in the back of your mind. Non-employment rates have been increasing, and then they've increased recently in this recession. Second fact, during this recession, employment has been disproportionately depressed for lower skilled men. Okay, so this picture, this isn't mine, I got this from, from a, basically um, a, a website, but I've replicated stuff that looks similar to this, but I like their colors without me making my own chart, which is, I want you to focus on the blue line. This is the fraction of jobs by men with a high school degree or less. And what I want you to see is that they fell in the recession, so this starts at the recession, and as it starts in the recession, jobs were lost until the end of the recession, and then nothing rebounded afterwards. Okay. For, for the other groups, the green line for college men, what you can start to see is not a whole bunch of jobs were lost in the recession, maybe relative to trend, but now we're kind of kicking back up afterwards. So fact one, jobs were lost. Fact two, they were disproportionately lost for lower skilled workers, and they stay. The persistence is coming mostly from lower skilled workers. Fact three, there's been a huge decline in manufacturing employment in the U.S. over the last decade. Okay, people have been talking about the decline in manufacturing in the U.S. for 30 years. This is the amount of manufacturing jobs in the U.S., in thousands, going back to the 1970s. And basically, what I want you to think about when people have been talking about the decline in manufacturing, just keep this magnitude in mind, we basically lost about a million and a half manufacturing jobs in the last 25 years prior to 1990, or to 1999. Okay, so the beginning of this recession, we lost about 1.5 million manufacturing jobs. And even since 1982, we didn't lose many. So the decline in manufacturing in the U.S. usually has come from the result of, not usually, it was the result of manufacturing jobs staying constant and the share of people, the number of people in the population increasing, leading to the declining share of manufacturing in the U.S. But I want you to focus now on the 2000 to 2007 period, well before the recession started. We lost 4 million manufacturing jobs in the U.S. between 2000 and 2007. Okay. Now, we lost more jobs in the recession, okay, another million and a half, two million jobs. And then it's, people, when you hear, read the newspaper, flick on CNN, they talk about the rebound of manufacturing. What they're talking about is basically from the trough to that star. Okay. An order of magnitude relative difference uh, if in the increase relative to the declines we got during the recession, and even another order of magnitude difference from the start of 2000. So basically, non-employment rates have been increasing for men. Okay. Disproportionate amount of increase during the 2000s, both prior to and during the recession. That's been disproportionately hit by lower skilled individuals. And then there's been this big decline in manufacturing. Now, fact four, the housing boom made the decline in manufacturing not as bad for lower skilled men as it would have otherwise. And I'm going to use this word masked. The aggregate economy from 2000 to 2007 was better than it might have perceived, been perceived otherwise because from the decline in manufacturing because the housing boom came along and lifted employment for these low skilled men. So now instead of putting in level space, I'm in share space. So this is the share of all men, again, without a college degree between the age of 21 and 55, out of all men, regardless of whether they work or not, who work in manufacturing, who work in construction, and who work in the sum of manufacturing and construction. Look at the manufacturing line. It's been declining over time. Again, from 83 to 99, it declined mostly because the number of men increased and the manufacturing jobs stayed fixed. From 2000 to 2007, you got the big decline because we lost all those manufacturing jobs. The construction share was roughly constant for 40 years before the recent recession, at about 10, 11%. During the, I mean, when I said the recession, before the early 2000s. From 2000 to 2007, the share of men working in construction went up by four or five percentage points, huge by historical standards. The share of men working in manufacturing plus construction remained relatively constant during this recession. So some of the manufacturing decline was absorbed by the increase in construction during this time period. After the, once the recession started, manufacturing continued to decline. The housing construction jobs went away. And the net effect 
on labor markets for low-skilled men was extremely dire. Okay, and this is for women. Notice that the manufacturing decline continued for women, but there wasn't as much of an increase in construction. It doesn't mean the housing effect didn't, housing boom didn't have an effect on women. I have some stuff showing later that the housing boom did affect women, but it wasn't through the construction sector. It could have been through mortgage brokers, real estate agencies. When housing prices go up, some of us want haircuts, not me, um, and we need more people to cut hair and such. But there was an effect on the employment of women, but it wasn't through the construction sectors. Okay, so you got these four facts in the back of your mind. Okay. Not employment rates going up, disproportionately affecting low-skilled men. During the recession, low-skilled men went up and didn't rebound. Manufacturing decline was extremely large by historical standards in the 2000s. And the housing boom offset some of that increase during the 2000s, at least in the shares of construction. So I've been working on this paper for a little while, and we're going to talk about it. I'm going to show you how I identify some of this in a second to ask the question, how much did the decline in manufacturing contribute to the increase in non-employment, particularly for low-skilled men during this time period? But I could do it for all groups, but particularly for lower-skilled men. Question one. Question two. How much did the housing boom mask the decline in the uh, uh, um, non-employment or the change in non-employment for low-skilled men during the boom period. If, another way to say it, if we didn't have the housing boom, how worse would have 2000 or 2007 look relative to what we actually observed in the data? Question three, how much of the change in non-employment that we saw during the recession, okay, not just the whole decade, but during the recession, could be attributed to changes in manufacturing and changes in housing boom? And question four, was there any effect of the housing boom on the propensity for individuals to accumulate skill? Normally what happens when manufacturing declines or any demand for low-skilled workers decline is workers have an incentive to accumulate skill. And I'm going to show you that the housing boom did two things, put people back to work, but also stopped people from going to school who normally would have gone to school because the labor market was weak for them. So those are the four things I want to try to tease out in the data. Okay? So let me just tell you the conclusions of the project. I'm going to show you a couple of brief, brief um, ways how I estimate this in the data. I'm not going to go through all the details for you, but I could show you how I'm going to try to estimate this. And then I'll try to give you a little bit of these counterfactuals in, a, in more detail. I'm going to do that in, a, in the next um, 10 minutes. So here's my conclusion. Structural shifts, what do I mean by that? Manufacturing declines. The decline in the manufacturing in the US contributed to 40% in the increase in non-employment for all groups during the 2000 to 2010 period. Okay, so this is a big effect. Most of that doesn't show up in the unemployment rate. So when the policymakers and you listen to the newspaper and they show you the unemployment statistics, the decline in manufacturing isn't showing up in the unemployment rate. Where does it show up? people who've stopped looking for a job altogether. So when people aren't working, they could either be looking for a job or not looking for a job. The decline in manufacturing is driving mostly the increase in people not looking for a job. Some of the unemployment rate, but most of it is on the people not looking for a job. There's a whole bunch of people who just gave up in this recession looking for a job, not in the labor force at all. A lot of that could be traced to the decline in manufacturing. During the recession itself, not during the whole decade, during the recession itself, about a third of the increase in non-employment could be either traced to the housing bust or the um, decline in manufacturing, the continuing decline in manufacturing. The second point that I want to conclude from this, and I've already said this once, so I'll go through it quickly, is that 2007 wasn't a steady state. So when we keep talking about trying to return the US economy to 2007, that doesn't seem like a right counterfactual. Why? Because 2007 was inflated in terms of the labor market because of the housing boom. And because of that, we shouldn't be using that as a target to return to. Third thing, the housing boom affected, lifted employment during the boom years and depressed employment during the bust years. The net effect of a housing boom on the economy over the whole decade was pretty small. Okay? The, it went up by 5% and down by 5%, and the net effect over the decade canceled things out. And then I already told you that housing booms seemed to deter a natural progression 
of declining demand for skill, which is people stopped accumulating skill. Now, how am I going to test this out? Okay. Well, here's the model I have back in my mind, just so you could kind of see a model in a terms that you all should be familiar with. There's a demand for skill, demand for workers, a supply of workers. The supply of workers is upward sloping. You and I are more likely to work when the returns to work are higher. If there's a decline in our demand for skill, demand for our skill, wages fall, and not, some of us should choose not to work at those wages. So that's kind of the mechanism I'm going to have in the back of our mind. When manufacturing goes away, the demand for low-skilled workers goes down, causing the wages of low-skilled workers to fall, and some of those low-skilled workers to exit the labor force. And that's what we're going to try to be picking up in the data. So how am I going to identify this effect in the data? Because you know, we were scientists. I've got to try to have some sort of variation that I want to, to identify. And what I want to do is I want to exploit what it's a fancy term I'm going to use, a local labor market strategy. What do I mean? I'm going to treat the US cities as being different laboratories. And some of those cities are going to get hit with different types of shocks. Different types of stuff is going to happen, and it's going to affect certain cities more so or less so than other cities. And then I want to see the effect of those types of shock, those types of phenomenon, on employment and wages in those different cities. Realizing that people can move across cities and lots of things adjust across cities at the same time. So we want to estimate those effects as well. And in the back of your mind, I want you to think about Detroit, a heavy manufacturing city, versus Orlando, which wasn't a big manufacturing city. I want you to think about Detroit that didn't have a housing boom in Orlando that did have a housing boom. And then there's a whole bunch of cities in between. Some of them that had manufacturing declines or manufacturing cities and had housing booms, like Bakersfield, California, and a whole bunch of other cities that had housing booms but no, not a lot of manufacturing, like Miami. And then there's going to be variation across all of these cities in the extent to which they are a manufacturing city and to the extent that they experienced a housing boom. I'm going to do this formally you know, in a statistical sense, but that's kind of the intuition that I want you to get um, in the back of your mind. And I'm going to use data from the census. The government collects lots of data about who's working where in different cities. Oh, man, that was a great Sorry. sandwich that just hit the ground. Okay. Um, so the government collects a lot of data that tracks who's working, the wages of people make um, at the individual level that we could group by cities and get some variation. So the paper is basically going to have lots of analysis like this. Some of it in regression form, some of it controlling for lots of things, but this is the essence of the, the paper. So what I want to show you here is this is the decline in manufacturing employment in a given city on the horizontal axis. Okay. So basically, when you're looking to the left of the, uh, the x-axis, those are places that got hit with really bad manufacturing shock, Detroit. When it says predicted, that's just a fancy way I'm going to try to control for some other stuff, basically based upon the city's initial manufacturing share. So the Detroits are on the left side of this picture. The Orlandos are on the right side of the picture. On the horizontal axis, you have the decline in, or the change in non-employment. So it's not the decline, the change in non-employment in the city. All of this prior to the recession. So none of this is identified off the recession. All of this is in the 2000 to 2007 period. And what I want you to take a look at is there's a sharp negative relationship. Places that had the biggest declines in manufacturing, the Detroits, had the biggest increases in non-employment during this time period. So from 2000 to 2007, Detroit's, on average, were doing relatively worse than Orlando's, on average, during this time period. Now, I've only drawn this picture for the cities that didn't have a big housing boom. Okay, so these are, all these circles are the cities in the bottom part of the distribution of house price increases between 2000 and 2007. So it probably doesn't even include the Orlandos. The triangles are the cities that had the housing boom. And what do I want you to note about the, the triangles? You see the same relationships among the high housing price boom cities, that the more negative the house uh, manufacturing decline, the bigger the increase in non-employment. But I also want you to see that most of the triangles are below the blue regression line. What does that mean? That on average, housing boom cities had lower increases in non-employment than non-housing boom cities. So the two things you should take away from this picture 
is that the worse your manufacturing decline, the higher your increase in unemployment. The higher your housing boom, the lower your increase in unemployment. The red triangles are below the blue, cir blue circles on average. How much on average? About two percentage points. Okay. And we have lots of pictures like this in the paper where we kind of do this for wages. The cities that had decline in manufacturing had lower wage growth than places that didn't have declines in manufacturing. Places that had housing booms had higher wage growth than places that didn't have housing booms. So using this types of variation, we could try to isolate the effect of a manufacturing decline and a housing boom on employment. Okay? And in the paper, we do lots of other statistical stuff to try to isolate variation that we think is exogenous to other things going on to try to tell a causal story for these types of relationships. Okay. So with this, we could do these counterfactuals now, getting estimates for these relationships of the elasticity of a manufacturing decline on the propensity not to work. And then we could predict how much did the actual decline in manufacturing contribute to the increase in non-employment? And that's that red line. That's my prediction from the, the paper. This blue line is just data. So how much did non-employment actually increase? And this is for all households, not just low-skilled men. We're finding about 42% of the increase over the decade as a whole in non-employment could be contributed to the decline in manufacturing. The housing boom, that's that black line, the housing boom actually reduced non-employment. It actually put people to work. Okay? But then it went away. So notice the housing boom in the housing bus period, employment went away, and you're right back where you started from on the zero line. The net effect of housing and manufacturing is the purple line. What do I want you to notice? The purple line is below the red line during most of the 2000s. What does that say? That the labor market was actually propped up by the housing market, the increase in non-employment was actually smaller than it would have been otherwise if there was only a manufacturing shock. And during the recession, the purple line, housing and manufacturing, explain about a third of the increase in the blue line during the recession. So just looking at the 2007 to 2011 period, non-employment went from two percentage points to over seven percentage points, about five percentage points. And the purple line, manufacturing decline plus housing decline, went from 1% to 3%. So basically, two percentage points of the five percentage points could be explained by the decline in manufacturing and housing, which is about a third. Okay? And so that's where I'm getting my counterfactual. So this is what we do in the paper. We do this separate by group, low-skilled men, high-skilled men, low-skilled women, high-skilled women. We find that the biggest effects are on low-skilled men. The smallest effects are on high-skilled women. We estimate migration responses. We try to figure out, these are adjusted for some of those types of things, how people are moving in response to the shocks. Because if you're basically Detroit gets hit, people could get out of Detroit and go to other places. We have to account for those types of things. And what we conclude from this paper is that 40% of the increase in non-employment over the whole decade, 30% or so during the recession itself, is attributable to things that what I'm going to call are more medium to long run factors, okay? medium to long run increases over time. This is not the cyclical unemployment stories that you hear in the newspaper, that people are temporarily depressed. And if only the economy could get better, they could go back to work permanently. This is telling us that there's certain factors that are persistently keeping people out of the labor force. And for those of you who know the US economy, just think Flint, Michigan in the 70s, blown up in a much bigger scale. There's people who are sitting idle that don't have the skills to fill the jobs at the current wages for which they're willing to work. Okay? And then when we start thinking about policy responses, cutting taxes, okay, putting people back to work through public works problem, programs temporarily, if those programs are temporary, they will only have temporary effects on labor, um, the, the, the work um, employment prospects of this group, and they won't have these permanent effects for this type of unemployment. Now, how long does it last? Well, over time, what people usually do when the demand for their skill goes away is accumulate more skill, okay, train themselves for the jobs that are out there in the economy, and that just takes time. How long? Some people estimate it could take a generation. Some people say it could be shorter than that. But this uh, non-employment could be last, long-lasting. Let me just show you the last thing, and then I'll conclude, which is this is the propensity for individuals. The red line is women. The blue line is men. 
I'm now focused on an age range of 18 to 29 year olds who accumulate at least one year of college. So that's what these graphs are, the propensity to accumulate at least one year of college. The first thing you should notice is women now outpace men in the propensity to go to college. Both rates have been increasing until about when? Okay, right at the beginning of the housing boom. Both lines break trend. The dotted lines are the trends based upon the pre-2000s path. Both lines break trends in the 2000 and then accumulate after during the housing bust to get back towards trend. So what we try to use is this local variation. Try to take a look at the propensity to, for people to be enrolled in colleges at the metropolitan area level, the city level, or the state level in places that had housing booms versus places that didn't. And we found that in the places that had housing booms, people were much more or less likely, much less likely to go and get accumulate one year of schooling than places that didn't have a housing boom. Okay. Almost all of this effect, when I say almost all of it, I really should be more precise, all of this effect is on the propensity to go to a two-year college, a community college, or a trade school, and none of the effect is on the propensity to go to four-year college or to graduate schools. Which makes sense, the people at risk of going to work in the construction industry or industries boosted by the housing are on the margin of going to a two-year school and not on the margin of going to a four-year school. And uh, from our regression estimates, we could explain about 50 to 70% of the deviation from trend from these housing price movements over this time period. Okay? So not only did this housing boom mask the manufacturing declines in the 2000s, it might have prevented some workers from going and accumulate the schooling that they would have gotten otherwise. Now we're finding here that other young people are now going back to school. One thing we haven't done yet, which is next on our list to look at, is whether those people who were 20 in year 2002, who left, didn't go to college because they went to work in construction, and who are now 32 years old, or 30 years old and not 20 years old, did that person go back and get schooling now? Or is there these different younger people coming back into the school? Have we left a generation of individuals with less skill than we would have had otherwise had it not been the housing boom? Put more money. What? Put more money. Temporarily, temporarily more money. And people respond to incentives. So during that time, they, they, they did make more money um, at that time. So these are my conclusions. So what I want you to think about is we have this group of individuals, particularly lower skilled individuals, particularly lower skilled men, who normally would have worked in the manufacturing industry whose wages have fallen, and as their wages have fallen, they've chosen not to work anymore. They've left the labor force. And as they've left the labor force, they're sitting in non-employment. They're not working anymore. And that has increased over time. And now going, the housing boom in the boom period kind of masked some of that decline. And actually, the labor market was much weaker in 2000 to 2007 than we would have thought otherwise. So some of what we're observing during the recession, not all of it. Okay, at best, I'm doing third to 40%, depending upon the period. But some of what we're observing in this recession is just a, the decline in manufacturing and the correction of the housing market, and not something that's a recession effect, but something that's more long-term and persistent that we, as a society, might want to grapple with a little bit more, and that might not respond to temporary tax cuts or temporary monetary policy stimulus or temporary uh, public works programs, um, it might be something more fundamental and persistent. I'm going to take a little different uh, approach to this. I'm going to talk up from my experience in corporate America as to some of the pressures that's driving this. Um, I, for what Eric says, of course, I can uh, agree with uh, exactly what he's talking about in terms of the impact. But from the corporate side, it's interesting the way this plays out, and I'd like to spend some, some time on that. So mine won't be as data-driven as, as Eric's is, but I think you'll find it interesting. Now, as, as, as uh, Eric pointed out, the pressure on the American worker is not new. This has been going on for a long, long time, but I think the economic events of 2007, 2008, 2009 really brought about a new pressure on, on the situation. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Also, the evolution of the emerging markets is having a profound effect on the way American companies think about how they run their businesses. And I think that when you, as we go through this, you'll see that there's a, there's a new perspective on, on the way to think about uh, going outside of the United States with your business than where we were 10 years ago. Uh, I think that I'll also go through this and at the end, talk a little bit about my perspective on what the future holds and a little bit my, on my own perspective about what 
can be done to deal with this? Because uh, I think there are some, some not solutions per se, uh, but the solutions start at home, and I think we can, there are some things we can do. Uh, let me just tell you what we saw in, 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 at the time of 2007. Um, I've been uh, at treasurer of IBM for five years. Um, I just moved into the risk area, um, and uh, I had responsibility for treasury still, but I also had responsibility for risk management. Uh, and one of the things we saw, we saw the auto companies get into trouble. We saw the beginning of the housing collapse, the very early indicators. And we looked at that. We, we, the first thing we said was two big sectors of the American economy, they've broken down. We're in for a real problem. We didn't know how long it was going to be. We didn't know how deep it was going to be. But we knew it was going to be tough. Uh, housing, of course, as Eric has talked about, uh, created a tremendous opportunity for employment but created a bubble in terms of what was going to ultimately happen. And we know that, knew that a lot of people were employed in that sector, and those people were going to be out of work. And we knew that those people were de would create, de normally create demand, would not be creating demand, and it was going to have an impact on the economy. Exactly where it was going to ripple through, exactly what companies would be affected first, we didn't know. Of course, a lot of, everyone was our customer. As you can imagine, from the, the, the business that we were in, Everyone was our customer. So we, and a lot of the bigger companies uh, were the big customers, the ones that really spent the money with, uh, in big dollars, OK? Uh, and uh, of course, the re when the housing market broke, uh, we, we know now that it was a very slow recovery. Uh, and of course, that means very big impact on low-skilled labor. And if you ever watch a, a construction site, what you'll learn is very quickly that there are a few people who are very highly skilled do some key work, and there are a lot of people that have very little skills that carry boards, dig holes, move stuff around, and basically support the whole process. And those people are the ones that really don't have an opportunity once they get broken out of these, these, these markets break down. And that's what we're seeing. And this, the whole thing highlighted the problem. So what do we see? There was a broad impact on U.S. businesses. The reaction among corporate America was immediate uh, as once the data became clear. Uh, I can remember having meetings with clients where we would talk about the impact and everyone was just flat on their back about what the impact was, what were they going to do about it. Uh, what it brought about in corporate America was a renewed financial focus on their operating results, on their balance sheet, on their cash flows. What are we going to do about protecting our corporation? And what we saw was immediate cutback in strategic growth initiatives. Investments that had long paybacks, Investments that had probabilities that were uncertain in terms of how much the payback would be got put aside. The focus became short term. How can you save my cash? How can you save my capital? How can you put me in a better position to operate more efficiently? Right? Short term focus, quick, highly visible projects that could have payback with high probabilities. That was what people were focusing on. Do more with less. Uh, the, the feeling was that we, we, we need to operate with a more efficient uh, overall uh, cost structure, um, and we needed to adjust our, our infrastructure to do that. They wanted the company to come in and help them do that. And a lot of the things we were selling, uh, when, when we focused those, were able to accomplish those kinds of goals for people. So we had actually did quite well during that period of time. So what, what is the result of that? They improved their, their, a lot of the data systems. They improved their operating efficiencies. They reduced, they reduced their cost structure. They be, developed a more flexible manufacturing process, a more flexible operating model. Uh, they went to a lot more part-time workers, uh, people that were hired on an as-needed basis. Uh, they, they developed a lot more ability to grow modestly, grow modestly with very little future investment, with lo low future investment in terms of hiring employees. All right? And they began to accept more and more of sourcing from wherever the opportunity for low cost and low high savings was. So we saw people willing to go to India for their, a lot of their services, they do them remotely, accounting, accounts payable, uh, administrative work, data monitoring, system monitoring. With technology the way it is, you don't have to do that in the US. You can do it from anywhere in the world. And you saw a lot of people willing to take that big step of being comfortable with putting a lot of their key processes, although administrative, but key processes nevertheless, in remote locations and with outsourced parties. So what came out? The impact was they're able to thrive 
despite the new normal of economic weakness. You know, you hear, uh, you know, the uh, PIMCO talking about the new normal of low economic growth. Uh, corporations got, are able to get good returns with very low risk. They are strong. They are considered the new sovereigns now. They have strong balance sheets. They have strong cash flows, uh, and they continue to make efficiency investments to grow their businesses. So they're able to deal with get, in the growth markets we have in the United States, the growth rates we have in the United States. They're able to participate in those without making, uh, without hiring a lot of people, without building up their their uh, employment uh, infrastructure. Uh, and that increases the pressure on U.S. workers, even as we crawl our way out of this recession. And most impacted are the low-skilled, semi-skilled uh, employees. Let me just talk a little bit about, I'm changing subject a little bit here now, and I'm going to talk about the way corporations evolve over time. And the corporations I've worked for have been uh, global companies to one degree or, or, or another, some, some less so, some much more so. Okay. So, the, the, but, but almost always, so this, is, this is summarized at a 50,000 foot level. It almost always begins with exporting your product overseas because you believe there's a market for it, you've tested it, and you begin to export. You move to a local manufacturing or a service base uh, for, your, for your product or your service, and you move then, as you develop different countries, you then move to a regional management structure where you uh, begin to develop uh, a regional management uh, cadre of people, all right? <coughs> What does this do for you? Number one, you're, you're now dealing with new markets. Uh, you need to uh, be attractive to those markets. So you begin to hire people in those markets to run your business so they can be representative of you in those markets. Uh, market access requires that you understand the culture and the mar have market savvy about what the market requires. So you develop and promote executives who have those kinds of skills. At, and this is all occurring over time, of course, for many corporations. As I say, some are far, pretty far advanced, some are still doing this. At some point, you move to what I consider could be a truly globalized model. A truly globalized model says you see the world from wherever you are, you see the world as an opportunity. You're looking for skills and you're looking for cost. And it could be in uh, Indonesia, it can be in China, it can be in India, but you really don't have a, a, you get more and more comfortable as you develop these, these businesses in these growth markets and you develop your executive teams, you become much more comfortable with operating there and you're much quicker to be able to pick up your resources and move the, the need for resources to those markets. But from a cost and skill basis, we even found accounting skills um, in, in Asia, major accounting skills and put, able to put major accounting groups in Asia. Uh, and because we found we were able to get much lower cost and a high level of quality out of those people. But you have to get to the point where you're comfortable operating in a global, in a global marketplace with your, with your resources dispersed all over the world. And you then begin to pick up also the market inputs to your design and planning process uh, and you want to make sure you're visible to the marketplace so that by bringing some of these uh, jobs into those markets you also improve your market access. And that becomes part of the motivation as well. So the opportunity shifts east. Uh, what we've seen is the relative growth rates in the United States, very low. The relative growth rates in the Asian markets, and I add uh, Latin America to that, uh, Brazil primarily to that. Uh, much higher Asian growth. Businesses reach, uh, now reaching significant size as we talk today. Some of these businesses are becoming big influences on their rate of growth. The United States is low growth. Europe is flat, so the opportunities to grow in those markets for most industrials, of course the apples that are doing very unique things and are able to get high rates of growth, but for many industrials uh, and many uh, other companies uh, that are, that are uh, major uh, long-term old line companies, the growth rates of the economy are the fundamental drivers plus whatever you add in terms of your own product design and, and, and ability to grow your share. And so those, those influences of, of uh, uh, you're, de you're defined by the market growth opportunities. Asia, Latin America are big opportunities. And they're now becoming significant and big significant factors to the growth rates. So this continues to shift your investment. This continues to shift your emphasis and continues to shift the way you think about where you're willing to put your, your workforce and where you're willing to hire your workforce. So you look at the way many co large corporations are today, many of them are well over 50%, some are up approaching three quarters of their, 
uh, revenues come from outside the United States. Uh, and the employment is similarly dispersed in terms of worldwide, uh, the worldwide uh, employment base. Again, there's continuing pressure on U.S. employment uh, because of the slow growth in the U.S. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the service companies. And this, I think the service companies is an interesting example because this started about 10, 12 years ago, uh, a little more than that, uh, around that time now, uh, where and, and the technology service companies is, is one of the groups here. Uh, it started with the, actually the Indian companies coming into the United States beginning to service companies in the U.S. from India. Uh, and they offered very low cost services to some very simple things, call centers, for example, some bookkeeping, some administration. Uh, American companies reacted to that uh, by addressing the Indian market and actually tackling the Indian companies head on in their own market. They learned how to hire, they learned how to train, and they learned how to replace uh, due to the high turnover rates. You can live with a 20% turnover rate. You can do that, but you need to have the process in place to be able to do that. Right? Uh, by, and of course, that's the, it, it, even in India, you have to work, salaries are rising in these countries, and even there you have to work to keep your salaries low, and one of the things you can't do is to pay everybody to stick around. If they want to leave, you've got to let them go and replace them, so that becomes part of the process. So companies move to use the India skills as a base to be able to put pressure on their cost structure, uh, and that rolled into the U.S. and European marketplace. It, what first was thought of as perhaps a way to improve margins quickly converted into a new price point in the industry. Uh, low labor costs reset prices across the board. It became almost a necessity to offer that. And for those clients who were willing to accept the risk of operating, having a part of their operations in a foreign country, uh, with in data flowing back and forth over the internet, that became uh, a requirement to service those clients and to, 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 uh, to have the business from those clients. In manufacturing, a little different. Uh, again, market opportunities overseas are great. People see the opportunities. Uh, it entices the Western firms to go there. Uh, it starts with exporting to the marketplace. Quickly figure out that your products are a little bit too expensive. Uh, you quickly, there you find that you're competing against products that have shorter lifespans, that, that have lower cost points, uh, and you work to, begin to work to reduce your cost. Uh, sometimes you just take a lower margin on your products and uh, sell them into the marketplace, but then you move to find ways to get your costs. What do you do? You bring in local suppliers and local uh, subcontractors to make pieces of your product, to take advantage of their low labor base. What happens? They become more proficient at making these kinds of products. They gain skills. They gain technology understanding. All right? They begin to make these components for you, but they also begin to make the products for other people. And now this begins to flow back into the United States and begins to drive down the, the cost structure of not only your company, but your competitors as well. And that begins to roll through and brings down the price points of these products. And we're into the model again in the, in the manufacturing sector. So the pressure remains on the worker, the U.S. worker, to, be a, to, to become competitive with these kinds of pressures. And that's what you see in a lot of the, the industrials who are pushing back hard on unions pushing back hard on their uh, labor costs to get those uh, labor unions and, and labor bases down to be more, more competitive in the U.S. for the U.S. market based upon the fact that uh, other uh, competitors are bringing in components that are made overseas. Weekly wages. If you take a look at the data uh, that's been recently been published, uh, you know, you look at some of the low uh, levels, of the ba basically labor rates, lo uh, base labor rates, um, if you look at uh, China, these, these rates are, are, are about uh, China, and you can see the rate of growth there, quite substantial from 2010 to 2012. Yet they don't even reach the U.S. minimum wage, at least not yet, right? And similar things are happening in India. You look at the lowest quintile of U.S. workers, $552 per week. Uh, it's still substantially away from that. So China's beginning to close the gap. Labor's you know, costs are rising, labor costs are rising, people are demanding uh, salary increases, but we still have a long way to go before the middle class, a middle income earner in the United States uh, is competitive with these markets. If you look at China professional salaries, uh, while these are not competitive with U.S. salaries, they are beginning to look substantial, and they are beginning to look more like U.S. salaries. So there is a basis of a middle class in China from this, 
And I think that this will continue to grow and, put, uh, and, and, and result in a, a, a much improved uh, co a, a competitive position for the U.S. over time, but uh, not, not yet. But yet they're beginning to look a lot like U.S. salary levels. Long-term GDP trends, and this is what's attracting people. You see growth rates of 6%, 4%, 7, almost 7% in India projected over the period of 2011 to 2030. Uh, that's what companies are looking at compared to the U.S. of 2 to 2.3, 2 depending upon which indicator you look at. Uh, looking out in time, China will flatten out. Of course, it's got a demographic problem, and it's going to flatten out. But the Indonesia, uh, China, are, uh, India are going to continue to look very good in terms of growth rates. Latin America also. Brazil should look very good. So high growth rates in the emerging markets will continue to attract corporations and keep them focused, both east and south. Um, and they're going to gain more and more confidence about operating in those environments. And that's going to continue to put pressure on, on cost structures to remain competitive in the world environment. What do I think are the changes necessary for the U.S. worker to be competitive? Uh, U.S. workers' salaries, I don't see the ability to grow their, their salaries. They're going to have to stay flat to decline uh, as the pressures con uh, continue from overseas. Uh, Non-U.S. salaries will have to continue to escalate to get the U.S. worker more competitive. Uh, U.S. industries need to continue to sort out what can work in our economy, given these pressures. Not everything is going to survive. As Eric pointed out, a lot has already been lost. I think we'll lose some more before this is over. Uh, but we are going to have to sort out which ones are, can, can become competitive and which industries must move on to something else or, or pass on. Uh, U.S. employees need to upgrade education and training. Eric was on that exact point. They sort of dropped the ball on that in the last uh, decade, roughly. And so we need to get that back on track and need to accept uh, competitive uh, rule, work rules and habits and flexibility, something that you just don't get a lot of in the United States. I mean, that, that would help a lot. Uh, and they need to embrace the use of capital. I think there is a tremendous opportunity here for American workers to be competitive in some industries because of the ability to use capital to basically make their work more valuable. And if they're willing to accept that, and that means some of them are not going to be uh, working because they'll put some people out of work. There will be a base for American workers where they can be competitive in the world economy. And they need to prepare for multiple job changes and new skill sets because industries are going to die, technology is going to shift, uh, new, new capital equipment is going to come in, and people are going to have to learn that. If they want to stay competitive in the, in the world, they must continue to evolve their skills and expect that they're going to take a number of different jobs and a number of different training courses over their career. And we need to have government policies to uh, support these realities. Factors helping the American worker. I, I, my perspective, uh, U.S. technology, I think, still has leadership in many aspects in the world. It has a very great, uh, strong higher education system. And it, in my view, has a tremendous advantage over the world, which is tremendous energy resources, as we've discovered over the last few years, properly developed and properly implemented, I think it puts the United States in a very good position for the next 20 to 30 years. Uh, stronger U.S. economic growth would help, but I'm not too sure that can be achieved. Uh, and the aging of some of the emerging markets is going to be an interesting outcome as well. If you look at China, uh, you look by 2045, uh, China is going to have more people over age 65 uh, per, uh, per 100 than the U.S. And that's going to create a certain dynamic around China. But corporations recognize this, and they're already looking at Indonesia and India, of course, but also Africa in the very early stages of movement toward establishing uh, operations in Africa and establishing skill sets to manage operations in Africa is already beginning. So how long will these uncertainties go on? We don't know. Uh, there are a lot of things could break down along the way. Uh, will China uh, and other countries stall? Uh, will uh, China and India develop a middle class and therefore change their cult, their culture, evolve, uh, and demand uh, different work rules, more work rules like the United States? Will their work ethic uh, deteriorate from what it is today and their salary demand for salaries push it up faster? We don't know. And finally, what will the political financial stability, will it continue as it has been and give corporations the comfort to continue to operate and de build their businesses uh, in these, these markets around the world? And uh, if those things stay in place like they are today, the pressure on the American worker is going to continue. 
And it's up to the American worker, really, to give himself some education and work with business to work himself out of it. Thank you.